Well, welcome back to the ICAR stage. I'm uh, Jason Barton, and Director of Industry Technical Relations. And I am Kristen Felder, CEO of Collision Hub. And, and we're going to bust some myths. We are. And it's part of our OEM and industry linking pin mechanism for our Repairability Technical Support Initiative. We want to share some information for, with you this afternoon. We've had, this, kind of, this all kind of came about because a lot of social media postings that are out there about, well, ICAR says you can do this, and ICAR says you can do that. And we've got a legacy of general sectioning guidelines and kink versus ban. And we want to try to clear up some of those myths today. Yeah, we've got a lot of technicians that went to a class maybe in 1997. Um, didn't do any training really until now and are still taking a lot of those old repair methodologies and trying to apply them to today's new technology in the vehicles. And that's really causing a lot of problems. In fact, it's causing a lot of injuries, it secondary is. collisions. So um, we're going to remove all those myths. Now, I typically hear these myths in one of two places, Jason. I hear them from a technician or I hear them from an insurance adjuster yeah. that walks in the shop and says, well, iCar says you can do that or right. iCar says you can fix that. So. Um, let's go over the iCar vision and just make sure people understand who we really Correct. are. Yes. And so I mean, the iCar vision is that every person in the, in the collision repair industry has the information, knowledge, and skills required to perform a complete, safe, and quality repair for the ultimate benefit of the consumer. And that's what it's really all about is complete, safe, quality repairs for the consumer, making sure that those vehicles that we're putting back on the road function as designed. And, and there's been so many, so many technology changes with advanced high string steels and advanced driver assist systems that, again, the rules have changed dramatically and right. we've got, again, we're trying to clear up some of those misconceptions about there about what we actually, the position that iCar takes on a number of different topics. Right, and, and over the years we've gotten a little confused about who the real customer is in this business. We've gone shop to insurer, insurer to shop. We've let a lot of technology get in the way when it comes to the DRP programs, receiving assignments, getting paid. But ultimately, the only person we're here for is that consumer and the one that owns the car. And we've got a moral duty to Absolutely. put them back in something that's going to protect them as good as it protected them the first time. Absolutely. Um, so OEM procedures versus iCar. Yeah. Is, are they in conflict with each other? You know, that's again, there, there's been a lot of misinformation out there about iCar superseding OEM procedures. And I'm here to tell you right now, iCar says follow vehicle maker procedures. Unquestionably, that's exactly how to do it. Those are not recommendations, those are service specifications. That is how the vehicle was designed, how the crashworthiness of it, and the repairability. They, they spent a lot of time and effort coming up with these repair procedures. They are service specifications that should not be adjusted. And we had, you know, we had the ICAR uniform procedures for collision repair. They, they were, those were SOPs for shops. They were a step-by-step -step process, but they were designed to complement the OEM procedures. If you look at some of the procedures, it will say, Mark, and mark the cut location based on the vehicle maker information. So it's not just, you can just willy-nilly just go ahead and section something. It was based on the OEM procedures. It's always been about OEM procedures, and those, again, those are service specifications. Right, and a lot of those uniform procedures came out at a time when we didn't have a lot of OEM guidance. If we go back to the mid-90s, mm -hmm. the OEMs weren't in the game like they are now. Yep. We really did feel abandoned. We felt like we were trying to fix cars and figure them out. And, and ICAR came along and gave us some general guidelines, and those were great then. And then yep. the OEM stepped back into the game and said, hey, materials have changed, general doesn't make it anymore. And so those bottom. Mm. If I, I don't have something from the OEM, then I can go to the generals. But if the OEM exists, right. it is the top dog. And, and all these things that we're talking about today are published in ICAR Clues Repair News articles. They're available in ICAR courses. Uh, so all this information is readily available, and the Clues Repair News articles are available to everybody in the industry. So. You go to rts.icar.com or get to RTS through uh, our Repairability Technical Support website through icar.com. Everybody can click on every Collision Repair News article that we've drafted. Those are all available for the industry, including this one here. We've got this three-step process for how to approach repair. So again, first and foremost, always refer to the body repair manual for the make, model, and year in part in question. That's yeah. step number one. And to your point, if it doesn't exist, then look to see if there's any OEM-specific published position statements or general procedures. Uh, so a lot of vehicle makers, so side apertures, for example, outer panels on there, a lot of vehicle makers say, you know, you can section it based on the damage. Again, they've got a kind of a general position on that. That's what you would use if there's no specific cut line, no specific cut information. And then last, and you know, but certainly not least, if there are no vehicle specific repair information, no OEM uh, published position statements for something or against something, then you can look at ICAR published best practices. And these best practices are not, a group of ICAR people sitting in the room together talking about a bunch of ICAR staff. 
This is inter-industry developed and vetted best practices. We bring the vehicle manufacturers into the conversation. We bring collision repair professionals into the conversation. We bring insurance companies into the, into the equation. Uh, tool and equipment manufacturers. So again, these are industry developed and vetted best practices. And I think that can't be stressed enough that again, it's not just Jason and Kristen sitting together and coming up with these, these best practices. We would these come are, up with some best practices. <laughs> that's that's but right. right. These are industry fantastic. developed and vetted. We should do that. We should do that. We that would be, come up with something, I bet that you. That would be kind of awesome. Perfect. I wonder if we could get any investors or uh, really. uh, one thing I wanted to say back there is that when you talk about tuning into the year make model specific for the part in question, it's just because Toyota or GM has a procedure for one way of doing um, a D-ring on a Camry doesn't mean that that's the way we're going to do it on certainly on like an Avalon or that's right. the way we're going to do it on a Sienna or whatever. So and even to your point, I mean, if it was if you worked on that Camry last week and you got a new Camry in this week, still go back and take a look and make sure that that procedure hasn't changed because they do change from time to time. Document it when you did it with that information date, time, make sure you got that information there. So Put if something happens a year from now and the positions change or the procedures change, you've got that in your repair order file. Exactly, exactly. So this one's a big one. This is one of the ones that we misapply the most. Yes. And unfortunately, I'll put that insurer hat on. I think this is one of the ones that we uh, misunderstand the most and we try to enforce wrong more than probably anything out there. General sectioning guidelines, Yes. do they apply today? The, the general section guidelines that we developed back in the 80s on mild steel vehicles are not applicable to today's closure repair environment. So I'm, when it says that I'm seeing this picture of this, and we're going to, what was that, a, was it a 16 Cadillac that was getting a rear body clip, and, and we about lost our hearts on the <laughs> internet? So that's, that's a no-no? That's a no-no. Okay. And again, so, and, and quite frankly, let's, let's just say hypothetically that general section guidelines still did apply today. You find me a place on a vehicle today that meets the criteria. Where, how would you determine what's a reinforcement versus what's a collapse zone when you're dealing with multiple types of steel on a single part? Whether you've got Taylor roll blanks, you've got Taylor welded blanks. So which parts are designed to collapse, which parts are designed to reinforce, and which parts are just, that would have, so I'm not, even sure there's a, I'm not even sure there's a part on a vehicle that would qualify for general section guidelines today. I, I, would, I would have to agree there. And the thing about a unibody vehicle, and it, it kind of goes back to what we're looking at in Dallas right now with the suit, is that there's a misconception of what parts are structural and are not. And a lot of technicians will tell me, oh, it's just a quarter panel just or it's quarter. just a roof panel. Yep. Um, it's just, just steel, Kristen. How does it apply? Well, in a unibody structure, it's how the vehicle goes together. Yeah. Um, how those joints um, are connected, how they're connected at the factory, how are they they're then reconnected during the collision repair process, has to do with where that load goes, and that load yep. is that transfer of energy. So people died in the 60s, 70s, and 80s in car wrecks because we, we, we boggled their brains around a yep. little bit. And so we finally got smart enough and realized we need to make vehicles softer, and the softness means we're still going to hold up in a collision, but we're going to transfer that energy around those occupants. So those G-forces, which sometimes in a wreck can get to a G-4, 5, greater than what a fighter pilot you know, in, yep. endures, those G-forces don't go into my soft-tissued body. Yes. And thankfully, we're having more people survive accidents on the road today than ever before. Airbag so timing when, plays into it. Everything. Exactly. Yep. When we start making up sectioning posi you know, positions, we start changing load path, we start putting lives in Absolutely. danger. So this is the published Thing that we have now for general section guidelines. If there are no published section procedures available from the vehicle maker, do not section. Do not. Period. The complete part should be replaced at factory seams unless the OEM allows for a partial part replacement at a factory seam. So what we're talking about, so we talk about partial part replacement. It could be sectioning or partial part replacement at a factory seam. So if you need a saw, sectioning. If you need a drill bit, partial part of the factory seam. And there are a lot of vehicle manufacturers that will allow that for assembly so that we don't have to put the entire rear rail in if we just got you know, a 12 inch extension at the end that's got a nice factory seam there. So that's acceptable. Yep, yep. And it looks like there's a lot of times you're writing these estimates or you're looking at the car and you're like, man, if I do that, it's going to total. We had a Cadillac CT6 up in the, on the East Coast that the rail meant I was going all the way under the seat. And man, by the time I get in there and take apart everything that attaches to that to get that rail in, there's going to be a total loss. Right. Yep. Very intrusive repair, uh, damaging OEM spot wells, damaging OEM corrosion protection. So again, it's great that a lot of vehicle makers do allow that. Uh, so again, but yep. if there are no published procedures, don't do it. Yep. All right. So here's here's a big one. This next one's a big one. Okay. Am I get so excited on this one. This is you've seen this picture before. Oh. There no! we go. Yes. So. 
again, this is kind of how this all came about today, was there was a post on social media not long ago about clipping and uh. how it's a good repair. And iCar says, iCar says it's okay, you can Jason. do this. Now, I'm not putting my family back in that car. That's, that's not happening, okay? Um, you can only do a full body sectioning if you use general sectioning guidelines, which we say don't, don't apply. do. So again, we held a repairability summit um, back in May around Great Designs of Steel. We brought in, again, subject matter experts from vehicle manufacturers, insurers, and we say, we say again, don't do it. So again, we haven't even covered this since the 1990s. And we haven't written an article on this since the early 1990s on, it was a, on a Grand Am. Yeah. It, um, well, it should have been over in the 1990s. Correct. But somehow we just, you know, keep carrying it on. So we have, we, we have removed all our references and all of our courses, all of our articles are no, no, no longer exist. But again, people have it in their mind that ICAR says you can do this. So we hadn't really had a, didn't have a published position on it necessarily. So that's why we held this repairability summit, got the input on it. It was a pretty quick, it was a pretty quick conversation yeah. uh, about not doing it. So but, I mean, I gotta tell you, it's actually what scares me, Jason, is it's picking up. And, and there's one thing when I see it posted and I dig into it and it's a total loss rebuilder. The guy's gone out and bought a piece of salvage. Yep. He's trying to rebuild it and he's gonna sell it. But I've actually started to see clipping start to show up on estimates that insurers are providing with shops. And it's just an education issue. Yes. Um, and that's just, you gotta drill down, you gotta say no. Yes. And then if you need to get help, get some help and get some people involved, but the answer is just a clear no. We're not yes. doing that. And so again, here is the industry developed and vetted best practice says full body sectioning or clipping, whether it's through the A pillar or through the through the quarter panel, yeah. is right not right rear. It's all, it's <laughs> is not a safe or viable repair option on today's vehicles and should not be done under any circumstances. Full body sectioning will not result in a complete safe and quality repair. So Hey, hey, Don't Jason, do it. I just got a question for you now. Yes. I, I've been doing this for 30 years. I'm a, I'm a pretty good tech. I got certificates on the wall. You're and, not a part, you're not a panel awesome. changer? You're I, not a I'm, I'm changer? not a, I'm not a part you're changer. Bar, you're body I'm man. a real body you're man. You're a real body man? That's my favorite. Does I my skill level have anything to do with why Absolutely. this is or isn't a doable Absolutely option? Absolutely not. It has nothing to do with your skill level. I don't care how long you've been in the industry. Do not do full body sectioning. It's not a safe, viable repair option right. anymore. Even if I'm the best welder on the planet, this still is going to kill somebody. It's not a good idea. There you go. That's not a good idea. All right. Oh. Here's, this has been getting a little uh, It got a little attraction. A little You're momentum here. A little here. over 25,000 clicks on this article alone off of the Collision Hub site in the last 72 hours right. almost. Um, so, well, a little longer than that because I posted it on Saturday, so right. I'm losing track of time. But finally, uh, and first of all, I want to say thank you. I know this isn't an iCar thing. This is an industry thing. Yep. You've got insurers, repairers, and everyone in the room, and we all agreed that this was the position, but, but this is a huge problem, and our shops across the country are being asked to do this every day. Yep. We have some shops that are doing it, and I don't know why, and if you are installing used quarter panels, stop today. Um, and thank you for putting this out for us. Let's go it, over this a little bit. Yeah, so this one took a little bit, little bit of time to get out there. Uh, this actually came from a, a repairability summit when I asked the industry, what should we be looking at? And Brett Bailey was very outspoken. He said, we need you to address quarter panels, recycle quarter panels. Fantastic. And so we recognize that a lot of the vehicle man, vehicles that are altered today have a rolled hem flange. They're no longer the, you know, the nice 90 degree we could drill at the spot wells. These are their rolled hem flanges. Um, that are that are kind of very, very similar to a door skin. You won't put a right. you put, a, door skin. put yeah. a recycled door skin on. Yeah. It's just not a viable repair option. Uh, so here's what we're talking about. So here's an example of a rolled hem flange. You can see here. So that nice that tight curl at the bottom that's got adhesives on there. It just simply is not. You just can't get it out. And one thing that did come up during our, our conversation at a repairability summit was, well, General Motors has a has a has a, has a TSB because they had some corrosion challenges on uh, on some door skins. Right that you, you fold the lip back, address the corrosion, then put it back on there. But you're not opening up the, I mean, we're not opening up the entire hem flange on that door skin. We're just getting it back far enough so we can address the corrosion issue and then put it back on there. There's no way to do that here. You can't, you can't take that quarter panel off. Um, you're gonna create a weak joint in that, in that area. Again, it's not, it's not maybe not a safety issue as much as it's a quality and a workmanship issue. Um, so again, Industry developed and vetted best practice says quarter panels with rolled hem flanges are not candidates for recycled part usage. This is due to the removal process required 
Alternate removal methods will result in a work hardened flange that may fail. Right. So there you go, documented, best practice, industry developed and vetted from, again, vehicle manufacturers, collision repairers, uh, the Steel Market Development Institute was involved in this one as well, um, and insurers. So we had, again, a good inter-industry developed best practice for Yeah, us. an important document, an important step. Um, I, I encourage every shop that we work with to take this, print it out, save it, keep it at their desk. Um, this isn't a battle. It's not about having an argument every time something has to be repaired. It's about making sure both sides of the equation are educated and that at the bottom, we're making the best decision for the consumer. Right. They've invested in this car for a lot of them. It's the second most expensive purchase they'll make outside sure. of buying a home. They deserve our best on their piece of property, period. Absolutely. King uh, versus Ben. You ever heard about King versus Ben? Oh band? yeah, I used to have this little paper clip and I'd do this little, yeah. you know, little demonstration and I'd Try kink it and then I'd break out. the paper clip and I was a fantastic instructor. And again, the original King versus Ben was developed on mild steel vehicles. And we don't work on mild steel vehicles anymore. We're working on vehicles that have a ton of high and ultra high strength steel in them. So the old, the old rule said is that if it's bent, it's, it may be a cannon for straightening. If it's kinked, it should be replaced. Right. Uh, but one of the key components of it is that um, you have to restore the state and shape. Okay. So I so can't just apply a lot of undercoating when I'm you done. You can't apply, or yeah, you can't, you're not oh. supposed to do that anymore. Huh. I'm you, out. And you're not supposed to heat it up anymore. I either. can't heat it up. So I can't have my torch right. and my undercoat like 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 gunslingers attached right. when I walk into the stall. That's I right. Can't, ugh, I'm done. <laughs> My body days are over, Jason. So on today's vehicles, something that looks like a bent part, but if it's an ultra high strength steel part or a high strength steel part, it's not going to be possible to restore that state and shape. You might get the, the shape, right. but the state of that part is no longer restored. Right. So, now, I want to drive into the shape a little bit, because yeah. I get this a lot, of, and, and honestly, this pops its ugly head up a, a couple of times. That will, you know, the shape, Kristen, why does that really matter? I mean, a lot of times we're talking about rails and things that are hidden, the customer's not going to see them. By the time I put all the trim pieces back on them, but those shapes, the convolutions yeah. and the designs and rails are part of energy transfer, correct? Exactly, exactly. So again, it, and it, it's, a, it's a customer service thing as well. You don't want to have, have someone see that eventually. Yeah. But again, the, the, the shape is important, but the state is really what's important. Well, again, with that collision energy management, we want to make sure that that part absorbs the energy or transfers it depending on what it's designed to do. So yep. uh, kink versus bend rule is, is, has changed quite a bit. We don't really talk about it a whole lot because again, there's so many vehicle makers that have positions about not straightening high strength steel, not straightening ultra high strength steel, and I'll start another best practice we've got coming up on cool. straightening. So let's do it. There we go. There it is. All right, so yeah. straightening high strength steel and ultra high strength steel. A lot of vehicle makers have published information that says do not straighten anything over 600 MPA Due to potential cracking, tearing apart um, with a, a part of the vehicle structure. There are some vehicle makers, uh, General Motors for example, they do allow some minor straightening on things over 600 MPA, but still under, under 800. I don't know of anybody that has any option for cold straightening even on anything over 800. Right. Uh, again, Honda's got published information on not straightening, eight, you know, nine, they're 980, they're 1500. A lot of the vehicle manufacturers do. They've got repairability guidelines. General Motors has published uh, repairability guidelines. Ford's got published repairability guidelines that tell you what you can straighten. And it's pretty much limited to mild steel in many cases. Um, if you can straighten it, can you use heat to straighten it? And again, there's different thresholds for what, can you, what you can use heat on versus what you can't use heat on from, from the right. vehicle makers Limitations, as well. not only just heat or no heat, but temperature, number of times you get it to that temperature. Correct. There's yeah. a lot of limitations around that. Yeah. And so, it, so is this this 600, this really high strength steel? Is that something I'm only going to see in like Cadillacs or Lexus or Audi? Or is uh, that you're something only I'm going to see? you're only going to see it on every vehicle. So every car on the road. Every car. Oh, so now it applies much. to everything. Yes. So this isn't yeah. just something for my high end. Maybe not all about. the cars, you know. But the ones we're going to be repairing, yeah, they're going to be that aren't going to be total losses. Those, yes. Yeah. And one thing to think about with this that we we touched on it last uh, a couple weeks ago on the live show. We missed you, by the way. Wish you'd I, been there. I'm sorry I couldn't be there. Um, but we were talking about anchoring and pulling. And so there's a lot of people out there that'll say, leave the damaged parts on, make pulls, do et cetera. But some of this high strength steel, when you're talking about possible damage and structural pulling, there's a reason why we say cut it off. Yeah. Go find the damaged part, cut it off, and replace it. 
you start pulling around, you're pulling damage in a car, part of the car that you never looked at. We come back later in the post repair world and measure the vehicle and the vehicle was hit in the front end and suddenly we're finding a lot of damage on the rear end of the car. Well, some of that could have been load transfer damage, but some of it could have been you making pulls on it when it was over a certain tensile strength and you, you just kind of messed up there. So understand that metal also plays a role, not in just what I'm replacing, but what I'm going to be putting on the rack and how I'm going to be pulling it. So the, the, the industry developed and vetted best practice again on this is if there are no OEM statements supporting or warning against straightening, straightening should not be done on steel parts over 600 MPA. Yeah. So if you identify a part that's 600 MPA or higher and there's no OEM published procedure, industry best practice says don't straighten it, replace it. Doesn't matter if it's bent or kinked, don't straighten it. Yeah. And you can't, if you, if, and even, you know, if we start getting in even under 600, we don't want to be using heat on that because again, we're changing the, the, the structure of that, of that metal. And so we, if we're going to do straightening on a, higher, on a high string steel, not an ultra high string steel, which we're not ever going to do, but on a high string steel, we're not going to want to use heat because we are going to have, again, we're not going to be restoring that state and shape if we're trying right, to straighten exactly. it. Right, exactly. And there, so a couple of things that I always tell the shops that we work with. Um, one, make sure that you're, you're printing out all the information that you need at the estimate so that you're advising the technician in the stall what can or can't be done, whether that's something on the windshield or a sticker or whatever, that's great. Second thing I always say is, if you're an owner, you need to know every tool that's in your shop, and the days of a technician having a torch in their toolbox are over. Yes. Having a torch next to the frame rack, I still to this day walk into body shops and there's torches and four by four posts laying next to the frame rack. So make sure if they're there, you collect them and you throw them away. You may have some map gas if you're doing some aluminum yep. repair, um, but do not let torches just randomly run around your shop because if I'm an old tech, and I think that my experience level trumps OEM procedure, that thing looks real nice to just go and, and hit the trigger every now and then. Yeah, so. I used right. to use one a lot, sorry, I did. So what I'd like to do now, if uh, Dan, could you grab, a, grab the handheld, please? Does anybody have any questions about other kind of what does ICAR say uh, that we can try to address? May not have answers to everything. Um, or if you've got something that you'd like to see ICAR take back to the industry from a repairability summit standpoint, and start to get some other best practices. Or there's something out there that bothers you that you'd like us to address with the industry? Um, or again, if you have a question on, again, what does ICAR say? Anybody got anything for us? Come on, John, you gotta have something. I'm the sure. interactive portion of the afternoon. Dan, I got Jim. Who's that? John. Mr. Gear. Just a, just a point of clarification, isn't, doesn't advanced high strike still start at 590? I mean, wouldn't that be the cutoff for over well, instead of 600? It's, it varies. Some vehicle makers okay. will look at it a little bit lower, uh, but again, from an industry kind of best practice, sure. American Iron Steel Institute, steel market development, it's around that 600. Okay. Um, yeah. And as far as advanced high strength steel, that's just a catchy marketing term. Sure. We do sure. mild steel, high strength steel, mm -hmm. ultra high strength steel for, we don't, again, it, we, we did publish an article on uh, the, 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 the tensile strength is what matters. Right. So whether it's right. dual phase steel or trip steel or Martin Cynic steel, we need, that, we need to know what that number is, that, yeah. that megapascal tensile gotcha. strength on that. That's the key to it. And sure. different manufacturers say different things. I can have right. the same tensile right. strength steel and one tells me I can do one thing and the other tells me to do the other. Right. And that's the great thing about the RTS portal that ICAR has on the website. You can drill into that OEM's logo through that technical OEM technical information. And if there's a repairability matrix with guidelines, ICAR's made that available to you that you can review it so you can, you can know what's out there. You can also know whether it's worth your time and energy to pay for a day pass to an OEM's website to drill down a little bit more. So I, I tell everybody I start every day on the RTS portal and I start every estimate on the RTS portal. So uh, I, I don't know how people get along without it. And if I go into a shop and it's not one of their saved on their desktops, it is before I leave. So. Gotcha. And we Thanks. appreciate those clicks. Uh, yes. I think, are all the clicks me? <laughs> 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 there are you too. <laughs> yeah, thank you too, John. Appreciate that. What else? Anybody else got any questions or suggestions? Something you'd like to see us address? Anything at all? Wow. Nothing. No? Hey, you're doing easy, a fantastic job, easy, Jason. Easy crow today. We got to come up with something, though, or they're going to close Appleton, right? <laughs> if there's nothing else to do. Yeah. yeah uh, preparation around uh, where, where uh, a windshield is being replaced. Yes. What, what type of prep should be done around the area today? Great question. So windshield preps going to vary on the vehicle manufacturer again. So some vehicle manufacturers aren't going to want any type of coatings on there other than maybe some epoxy primer from time to time. We also have those now published on the RTS website. We wrote a series of articles on 
Your time is up. I just got to <laughs> cut them off. Where's the music, right? They I know, right? Get off the stage. Uh, so we, we've published a series of articles on different factor, uh, windshield preparation, steps required. So again, those are all available on the RTS website as well. Um, there's a link that says OEM glass re requirements uh, on the website as well. So they're all published articles that are available. Right. So it's going to vary. A fantastic question, because glass is one of the things that we do wrong more often than anything. And sometimes it's our own fault, sometimes it's a sublet fault, but uh, there's that special section on glass is huge yeah. right now. And, and, and since we're on the top of glass, one thing that I want to uh, mention as well is with a lot of these advanced driver assist systems, with the cameras in the rear view mirror, even if you're not touching the rear view mirror or the camera, you take the glass off and put it back in, a lot of vehicle manufacturers saying that it has to be aimed. So it's important to look into that. Um, again, on the RTS website, we have uh, an OEM calibration requirement search tool. You can look for make, model, year, and identify which conditions are gonna, they're gonna require some type of a, of a calibration procedure or an aiming procedure. Good. What else? Anything wow. else? You're, man, you're thorough. No, I mean, or that was easy. Or something. Right? All right. Well, like I said, I encourage everyone, like I said, start every day on the RTS portal. They publish news articles that are there, OEM repair information, updates on position statements. I mean, everything you need to know in one place. Um, if you're, help me if I'm right here, Jason. If I'm iCar Platinum, uh, it's free. Thank you. Yes. Uh, so if you were iCar Gold Class facility, if you're an iCar Platinum individual, um, if you're an iCar member, volunteer, instructor, or if you take four classes a year, you have complimentary access to the entire RTS content. Yes. All the closure repair news articles are available to everybody in, in, in the industry, but there is some things like our, our OEM search tools. Uh, those are available to our, to our, to our subscribers. Um, it's also available as a daily subscription or a yearly subscription, but I'll tell you one thing about the yearly subscription. This is a little secret, okay? Don't, don't tell John about this, okay? All right. So I hope he's not. I'm pretty sure he can't hear me. Okay. If you take the four ICAR classes, it's less expensive than the yearly subscription. So you get the training and, and you get the, the access. Yeah. So take I, the training, I mean, get the access. I know, you're, you're the nice guy. So it's like good cop, bad cop. If you don't meet the requirements to get RTS free, then you're behind on training anyway in your facility or personally. So take the classes, get up to date, and then keep that because the information there is great, but the information in the training classes gives you that basic knowledge of what it's like to be a technician, what's going to be needed to read and interpret the OEM procedures and make the best decisions. So it's not just about pulling something, printing it, and handing it to a tech and saying, here you go. There has to be that, you know, like a doctor goes to school for a long time before they touch a patient. Absolutely. Um, so we've got a lot of education to do there too. Absolutely. Yeah, vehicles um, have changed dramatically, and if we're going to deal with complete, safe, and quality repairs, you got to have training, you got to have the right tools and equipment, you got to know what you're doing. You got to follow those OEM procedures. Um, that's the only way to repair today's vehicles. Exactly.